Boa tarde a todos. Hello, everyone. My name is Rodrigo Castellari Afonso. I'm an MBA student at Berkeley Haas, and I'm co-president of Brazil at Silicon Valley. I would like to welcome you to the second day of BSV Digital, a series of digital panels about technology and innovation focused in Brazil. In last year's edition, Jim Knight shared with us that there aren't enough teachers in the world to provide a sustainable quality education. And therefore, we need to use technology to increase our teachers' reach. This statement is even more relevant now in times of COVID. Today, we will continue this discussion in the panel EdTech and Philanthropy with Sal Khan, founder of Khan Academy, free online learning platform with more than 100 million users and available in more than 40 different languages. And Jorge Paulo Lema, entrepreneur, investor, philanthropist, co-founder of 3G and chairman of Fundação Lema. Before we start, I would like to thank our sponsors and partners. Brazil at Silicon Valley is only possible because of them. I would like to especially thank our hosts today. Bank of America, who's also a partner of Can Academy and provides online education to promote financial literacy. Fundação Lehman, which has almost 20 years of work towards a Brazil that's fair, advanced, and with opportunities for everyone. Votorantim, a 100-year-old Brazilian family-owned company, which only in 2019 has supported more than 500,000 students. And our partner, Fundação Estudar, a community that supports, develops, and inspires young Brazilian students. Today's panel will have 40 minutes of discussions and 10 minutes of Q&A. Please send us your questions during the presentation on the Q&A button, and we will create them and share them in the end. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Jorge and Sal. It's a pleasure to have you here. Jorge, please take it from here. lately to the pandemic and uh, what you are doing to make yourself more effective. I've always believed that the Academy was the way to go and that online learning was coming and that it is a wonderful way to educate the whole world. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for you to expand your horizons and do a lot more. What are you doing? Yeah, this uh, the pandemic has been really interesting. You know, when we started to see schools uh, get closed in Asia, we started seeing traffic pick up. And then uh, the week before it was clear that we we're going to see school closures around the world. Uh, we, you know, it's one of the situations where you, you kind of look left, look right, and you say, maybe this is us. Maybe we have to step up in this. And so we immediately started uh, making sure that our servers could handle the load. We started making, we started uh, thinking about ways to support teachers and parents so they could structure their days appropriately and and not feel overwhelmed and then when those schools started closing we saw our traffic pretty much you know in, in brazil in the united states and in india uh be someplace between 2.5 and and 4x of what it typically is and so you know this is a really interesting time where obviously every day that goes by people are realizing that this might last a little bit longer than expected uh, you know, I think if this was just a one week or two week phenomenon, it wouldn't have had that many lasting implications. But I think uh, we're now in a world where people are seeing that, uh, you know, we're going to have kids in a lot of the world out of school for four or five months. We're going to see uh, next year's back to school. Uh, I, I guess you know, in both the Northern and Hemisphere, it's unclear what form it's going to take, uh, whether it's going to be normal, whether it's going to be some type of shift based schooling or whatever else. And so we're trying to do our best to uh, help support folks in this process. So how do we keep kids around the world learning over the next five, six months? And then as we go back to school, uh, they're probably going to have to switch back and forth between in-person in learning and online learning. And we want to make sure that we, we have them there. I think this crisis is going to be 
opening up all sorts of new avenues uh, for folks. Uh, you know, there's an open mindedness now to this uh, that, you know, we hadn't seen before. People were gradually moving in this direction, but this is definitely uh, being a catalyst to to drive, I think, a more more change in, in this direction. What are your major hurdles at the moment in terms of increased volume and increased interest? Yeah, you know, in, in a lot of ways, our main hurdle is ourselves. Uh, you know, we're, we're still a relatively uh, small team. Uh, and, and so I, I would say that, you know, there's 20 things we want to do, but realistically, we have the capacity to do, uh, you know, five of them. And we're, we're going to try to do seven by, by this back to school. So I would say that's the, the main thing. You know, there's all sorts of things we want to do. We, we're hoping to be able to do uh, very quick pathways for folks to remediate and fill in their gaps for this coming back to school because students are going to be all over the place. We're hoping to create some basic level forms of diagnostic. Uh, we're even doing exploration so that students can get credit based on some of their work on Khan Academy. Uh, we're trying to, I have a little side project where I'm trying to figure out ways to match students and teachers so that they can, students can get help above and beyond uh, the what Khan Academy can give asynchronously. Outside of what we have, what we can do, our, our, our resources, I would say the biggest issue is the biggest constraint is just the digital divide. It's the, the lack of internet access uh, at home and in, in, in large chunks of the world and especially in high, high need populations. Uh, you know, even in wealthier countries like the United States and many school districts, you might have 20, 30 percent of the students who don't have internet access at home. And these are the kids that you need to reach most. Uh, they were already probably falling behind and now uh, that the schools are closed, they're likely to fall even further behind. So I would say the internet access is the biggest friction. And then, uh, you know, there's smaller frictions uh, in terms of integrating with, um, you know, district rostering systems. I never realized how complicated rostering is, which is, you know, just how, how a district keeps track of which student is in which classroom and which school. Uh, but when we want to do it whole scale with districts, uh, we want to be able to sync those those types of things. But I think the digital divide is is probably the big one. And when the quarantine is over, what do you think will 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 remain from what you're doing now? I mean, or will people will people be moving in this direction at a faster pace? Uh, will they be using online, or what do you think will happen then? Um, I, I, it depends how long this lasts. Uh, if, if this back to school is kind of a normal back to school, which it's starting to look like it won't be, but if it was, then I think this crisis will have, will have accelerated some of the move to online, uh, because there's just, everyone is having to do some form of online right now. So it's increased the comfort level with it. Uh, people realize that there's a way where you use both. You know, something that I make very clear, online is not a substitute for in-person learning. For my own children or for anyone else's children, if I had to pick between an amazing teacher or amazing technology, I would pick the amazing teacher every time. Uh, but ideally, you don't have to make that compromise that you can have amazing technology in service of amazing teachers. And so we are seeing, and you know, as I was mentioning, this open-mindedness for this next school year for folks saying, okay, maybe we can lean a little bit more online so that if we have to close again, uh, we have a plan and that the, everyone's used to using those types of tools and using it for practice, for evaluation, for instruction. Uh, but, you know, by no means should this be viewed as uh, some types of a, a, a substitute for, for that. Have you had to adjust your curriculum or to special courses? Is there a big demand for something specific at this moment or can it be pretty much what you already had going? on before yeah yeah you know we we've we've never um obviously no one i don't think imagined this scenario that we're in we're in right now uh, but you know our vision was always you know can we build all of the core academic things or as early as pre-k we have an app called khan academy kids all the way through elementary middle and high school and uh the, and and so we found the things that we have been working on for the last eight or nine years to be unusually well suited for the crisis we're in. Uh, with that said, there's a lot of content, you know, uh, our language arts content, we just released some of it in the United States. Uh, it, we want to be able to improve that a lot more. 
a lot of what we're seeing is kids are going to have even more dramatic gaps as they go into a school into the next school year when schools open. And so we are creating these new courses. We've always had the different grade level courses, say in mathematics, but now we're also going to have these courses called getting ready for sixth grade, getting ready for fifth grade, which allows a student to fill in all their gaps as quickly as possible so that when they show up in sixth grade, they'll have as little learning loss as possible. Uh, and, and we're just trying to improve all of the mechanics on the site, make, pe make sure people understand how to use some of the things we have on our site as a, a, a form of a diagnostic so they can understand what they know and, and, and what they don't know. Any specific observations on the Brazilian situation that you are experiencing at the moment? Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll give my two cents, but this is where, you know, I would love your thoughts on this as well. I, I think you're closer to the ground, closer to the ground in Brazil. You know, we see, we've seen our Brazilian traffic pick up similarly to what we've seen everywhere else in the world, including the United States. It was, I think it, it took, a, it was a, a slight lag to what we had in the United States. I think it, it was a couple of weeks later that Brazil started seeing the, the mass school closures and saw the, uh, the pandemic pick up there. Uh, but um, yeah, we're, we're seeing, you know, before the crisis, well, our U.S. usage has been about two thirds of our total traffic on our site and about one third has been international. And Brazil is our biggest international geography. After the, you know, now uh, post crisis or during the crisis, our overall traffic is 2.5, 3x of what it typically is. And just our traffic internationally is now larger than our traffic was in the United States. Uh, and a lot of that is coming from our two uh, Mar you know, there's there's 45 translation projects of Khan Academy around the world, but Brazil and India are the ones that are the most built out. These are the ones where we have deep partnerships uh, with foundations and obviously your foundation and, and us, we've been working very closely for many years in Brazil, but uh, that's my visibility. I, I'm curious on your, from your point of view, what, what, you know, what, what's the situation, how has the situation in Brazil been evolving before the COVID crisis? And then what, what, what do you think is, how do you think it's, evolving because of the crisis? Uh, I think uh, this will speed up the interest of Brazil in online learning. Uh, it was moving along. There was interest and, you know, we've been working together and we have uh, some 4 million people using Khan Academy and a lot of teachers interested in Khan Academy and like that. And many public schools using it. But now I think things are really speeding up. Uh, uh, the government is more interested. Uh, one of the difficulties in Brazil is connectivity also. Uh, and uh, we've been trying to talk to people, telephone companies and the National Development Bank about the importance of improving connectivity. Uh, now everybody wants to speed it up. Everybody wants to do something. Uh, many of the municipalities that our foundation works with have, are requesting help in terms of online learning. So I think it's, it's re really speeding up. Uh, there is there's some talk there about uh, online learning being only accessible to the students of the, the better schools and like that because they have better connectivity. I think that may be a, a current problem, but as connectivity improves and we're able to move into online teaching with the Khan Academy and more public schools and like that, this will disappear. It will actually become an, an equalizer of the social gaps rather than and then one that a factor that increases the social gap. So I'm very optimistic that this is, will change the interest of people. I think it's very important that teachers are willing to use the method and do not consider it competition, but rather as a tool that can help them and that will help them teach the students better. Like that. So I think all this is going on and, and it will definitely be a, a much more important factor than it was before once the quarantine is gone. And very good for Brazil and education. Is this influencing the strategy of the foundation itself? Are y'all doing things differently because of what you're seeing because of COVID? Uh, yes, we had a, 
a board meeting of the foundation today. And we, we have a lot of metrics there and uh, many of our goals for this year are sort of being hampered by what's going on and like that. And, uh, so we're redoing our goals. And one of the important things was, well, what kind of goals can we set for online learning? And what more can we do there? Because that's that the big opportunity at the moment to, to help and to do something important for Brazil over the wrong run. So we are resetting our goals and putting more emphasis on online learning. As you probably know, I'm a, I like setting goals. I like people being evaluated based on their achievement and how they do. Uh, we're putting more weight on what the things we think we can do in terms of online learning for this year now. I don't like changing goals too much, but we're changing them a little bit and putting more weight on that. now. Yeah, that's pretty analogous. I mean, I think it's kind of the same goals, but the weighting, I, I think that's a good, good way of putting it. You mentioned the, the inequity, at least in the short term, because of it, it, lack of access to devices and broadband and I can imagine in Brazil that could be a, it's a very significant issue. What, what do you think folks could do in the near term to mitigate this? And, and how do you think that's going to evolve? Uh, well, you know, uh, we're making it just making more people aware that online learning is available. And uh, even if it takes more time to get federal government action to get something done. Uh, we have a very close relationship with over 350 municipalities in Brazil. And it's easier to do practical things at that level. Uh, you can talk to the mayor or something. Here, look, we got this program available. Don't you want to do it? And so we're doing a lot of that. And uh, many of these mayors are... Uh, want the teachers to learn more about it fast. Uh, we're able to do that also. So uh, I think, you know, and then on, on a larger scale, just improving uh, connectivity overall is important. You need the government, you need the BNBE, the National Development Bank to help with that. But just getting things done at the municipal level and like that is very important and easier to do and will have a big effect also. Fascinating. So, uh, you started Khan Academy as a, as a free platform. And uh, originally that was your idea. And, uh, our, you know, there are a lot of people here, a lot of young people, and they sort of debate whether they, what can they do to improve the world and can they improve the world more by setting up a business for profit or something like yourself, which, uh, which is not for profit? Can you comment a little bit on your decision and how you feel about it now? I think the, our young listeners will be interested in hearing about that. Yeah, no, it's 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 it's, it's probably the most uh, discussed question. There's some business school cases about Khan Academy, and it it, it off it usually does boil down to a debate on that. Uh, so, you know, to be clear, you know, my 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 previous life, uh, I used to work in tech, and then after business school, I was an analyst at a hedge fund. So I very much believe in for-profit organizations and markets and and their ability to innovate and 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 create value for folks. Uh, and but you know, when it was interesting when Khan Academy was just starting. It, part of it was emotional protection of it. Uh, I would, my, all my friends knew I had this crazy project where I was tutoring my cousins and I was writing software for them. And that so, slowly other people started using it. And you can imagine all my friends from business school, it's like, how are you going to monetize this? What's the business plan? And I wanted to protect it. I didn't even want to have those conversations. I was like, no, 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 this is just a project. I'm just doing it. I enjoy it. I have a job. This is great. Uh, but then around 2007, 2008, uh, you know, 2004 was when I first started tutoring my cousin and <laughs> 2006 was when I started making some of that software and the videos. <laughs> By 2007, 2008, I was like, you know, there were several tens of thousands of people using it on a regular basis. 
And, and, and I said, you know, this is, and I was getting letters from people all over the world saying, this is how they were able to pass their algebra class. This is how they're able to go back to college. And for me, it was very important to signal to those people that, look, I, I genuinely want to do this for them. I, for me, the satisfaction I was getting was just these letters and feeling like I was having an impact. And I, frankly, I still had a day job where I was getting paid just fine and I was able to do both. So I, I set it up as a not-for-profit then thinking, okay, I'm volunteering my time. Maybe I can get other people to volunteer their time for it. By 2009, I had trouble focusing on my day job because every morning I was waking up saying, what can I do on this Khan Academy project? And that's where the decision point really happened. I was getting some, you know, I live out here in Silicon Valley. I was getting venture capitalists approaching me saying, hey, I can write a $100,000 check for you right now. You could quit your job and we can turn this into, you know, an ed tech uh, for profit. And it was really tempting. Uh, uh, several of them, I got to meet conversation three or four. But, the, you know, eventually the conversations were, how are we going to monetize? Do we do this as a freemium model? Where are we going to put the ads? And there's nothing wrong with that, except that's that didn't feel right for what I wanted it to be. And I did a, a thought experiment in my head. I said, okay, it's delusional for a guy operating out of a walk-in closet. This is actually the closet that I was in. So I've come back to the future, so to speak. Uh, but I was operating in this closet and I was just daydreaming. And I was like, okay, imagine a success as a, as a for-profit. You know, Maybe you could become the Google of, of, of ed tech or whatever else. And I was like, that's nice. Uh, but you know, my day job as a hedge fund, I saw how much you could be the top company for one generation, but companies as ownership changes, especially public companies, by the time the next generation or especially two generations come around, the company can be very different. In fact, it's hard to point to companies that for you know, 50 or 100 years uh, have stayed true to their original founding mission. And I said, well, what organizations have been able to do that? And you know, it's, it's, the lar you know, it's, the non it's the museums of the world, the universities of the world that have been able to do that. And so a little bit of my dream was, well, imagine if Khan Academy could be this new type of institution. It has no physical buildings, but what if it could be the next Oxford, the next Smithsonian that could serve generations of people for a very long time, uh, but actually could do it on a completely different scale. Uh, you know, Oxfords and the museums, they do wonderful things, but they can serve several thousands or at best, you know, museums might serve a million student people in a year. We could serve a million in a day. We could serve uh, eventually billions. And so that was kind of the thinking. And then I, you know, I fine tuned my thinking a little bit, which is, you know, there's a, there's markets are awesome. I think for most parts of our, our society, but there's some places where either markets don't function properly. And that's usually where the decision maker, the, the payer and the user, the beneficiary are different people. And you definitely see that in education. And actually you see that in healthcare as well. And then the other place where, markets are maybe not optimal is where the market outcome might lead to an outcome that is not consistent with our values as a society. And actually that too, maybe healthcare and education are the two areas where uh, no one wants, you know, everyone wants someone's potential to not be based on their, their parents' income or, or where, they, where they grew up. And so that was a, the, the thought process of making it a not-for-profit. And it was a bit of a bet. It was like, it, the dream was, could it be, could it have the best of both? Could it have this lasting mission uh, that, that can uh, serve so many people and stay true to that, while at the same time be innovative, be tech-driven, attract top talent, have access to capital? And it was a bet. You know, in those early days, I was able to track some, you know, some of the smartest people I knew to it. But, you know, there, there was some skepticism. Maybe that was just the early days. Uh, but, you know, in hindsight now, I, I think it was, a, um, it was a great decision. I, I don't question it. I haven't questioned it yet because we've continued to attract really, really great talent. And what it shows you is, you know, I read this article when I was working at a hedge fund that beyond a certain income, people really just care about intellectually challenging work, a mission, and being around other people that they could learn from. You need to make enough to, to be able to pay the bills and send your kids to college and go to a nice restaurant or vacation every now and then. But, but above that, it's, it's these more visceral things. And so that I think Khan Academy's done a very good job. And so we have been able to attract really great t talent. We're a team of over 200 folks. Uh, you know, the, we are primarily philanthropically supported. And, you know, that, that has always been a little bit scary for me. <laughs> that, that, you know, what if the philanthropic uh, fashion <laughs> were to move away from Khan Academy and we might be in trouble. But, you know, I think it's our job to make the case that 
the social return on Khan Academy is really off the charts. In the philanthropic world, there's this uh, there's a metric uh, you know benefit to cost ratio, and you know in the in the for profit world, if you get a thirty percent return, forty percent return, that's considered great. If you get a hundred percent return, that's an amazing investment. In the philanthropic world, if you get a two x, that's that's still considered a very good social benefit to cost ratio, uh, and ten x is considered amazing. Pretty much any way you look at Khan Academy pre COVID, we were looking at about a two hundred to five hundred x. A social benefit to cost ratio and post and with during the pandemic because of our increased usage, the scale and the leverage is even more. So I hope that I can continue making that argument. And at the same time, we are looking at ways of having some earned revenue streams. For example, in the United States, the College Board uh, they pay us to provide free SAT practice to to the world. Uh, so we're looking at things like that where we can also generate revenue that's consistent with our our values. So. I, I feel I feel good about it, but but you never know. I mean, I'm curious for, on uh, from your uh, point point of view, what what got you into education philanthropy? Uh, I was in business and in an investment firm and trading away and doing relatively well and uh, and. W- w- when I started the business, I had no capital. I didn't, we didn't have a name, et cetera. So I just went out and tried to hire the best possible people I could. And, and in this process of hiring good people, I, I found a lot of talent that was uh, unknown. Uh, people from poor backgrounds who hadn't really studied them like that, but had a lot of talent. And so I decided, well, besides running the business, maybe I can help a lot of these other people that uh, have talent, but don't, don't get the proper schooling or don't uh, meet the proper people. So we started with my partners. I started a foundation to help people to study abroad, basically. And, and this was called Fundação Estudá and this, and this, uh, generated a lot of interesting people, a lot of talent for Brazil. People came back to Brazil and were entrepreneurs, ran businesses and like that. So I, I thought backing people and giving them a chance to learn or educate themselves better is the way to go. Uh, and uh, so mostly the foundations I'm involved with are doing that. Uh, They're trying to give people that might not have the possibility to study more or to meet the right people or set up a business or like that, get going. And it's, it's, it's very satisfying. It, uh, uh, I'm an old guy now. I don't, I don't like being around old people. Old people are boring. complain a lot. So it gives me a chance to be around a lot of young people who are out there learning about what's going on and doing new things. So I enjoy it a lot. And, uh, you know, from, and for Brazil, it's the most important thing that Brazil can do is to get people more, more educated and reduce the social gap and therefore uh, help Brazil find its place in the world. It hasn't been doing that well lately. It, with better people, it can do a lot better. But Sal, so what is your 10x and what is your big dream for 10 years from now? What do you think the, the Khan Academy should look like 10 years from now? Yeah, you know, um, I, I, it, it, my, my brain naturally dreams a lot. And so I'm always trying to bring myself back to reality. <laughs> but, you know, my, my, my dream is 10... 10 years from now, um, there are a billion people using Khan Academy on a regular basis and a billion people who say that this is what's allowing me to tap into my potential. And what that means is they can start as early as, you know, they're starting on Khan Academy Kids, which hopefully is available in all the languages of the world by that point, or all the major languages of the world. Actually, everything I'm talking about, hopefully by that point, is fully available in all the major languages of the world. But they're on Khan Academy, you know, they start early, they can go they can learn their math, their language arts, their science, their humanities through elementary, middle, high school. 
uh, as they have mastery. And, you know, one of the big tenets of Khan Academy is to be able to learn at your own time and pace. If you haven't mastered something, you get as many chances as you need to keep working on it so that you can get to that level of mastery. Uh, I hope in 10 years, you know, our site is that engage is, is that much more engaging and that for almost any student, when they fall into Khan Academy, they almost get addicted to learning uh, in a good way. And then as they master concepts, they're able to prove it to the world and they're able to even get proof of that or credit for that work uh, so that they can engage in, in jobs, apprenticeships, uh, higher education. I hope that, you know, what I just described, that's there for a child who might not have access to anything. But the ideal is everything I just described is being used in conjunction with amazing teachers and amazing schools uh, where teachers can leverage Khan Academy for some of that core academic content, allow students to learn at their own time and pace. But now teachers will be uh, armed, equipped with the same data that, you know, when I worked in finance, I had uh, to understand what's going on in real time, to be able to do focused interventions uh, so that they can focus more on the in-person interaction. They can focus more on forming bonds, doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with students or doing small group while other students are able to learn at their own time and pace. And school becomes this much more interactive human experience. So, you know, the one thing I talk a lot about is that I believe, you know, it should never be technology for technology's sake. It should never be, let's use technology so that we look modern. It should always be technology for a pedagogical goal or for a human goal. And if our goal is we want students to be able to accelerate their academic achievement, we want when people get together, they're able to interact more, which are which is a human goal. That's where I think some you know personalized learning tool like Khan Academy can be valuable. Uh, on top of that, you know, I, I have a little side project that I'm working on right now because of COVID, but I hope this becomes part of Khan Academy, where you know I wrote a book uh, seven eight years ago now, One World Schoolhouse, and the reason why I called it One World Schoolhouse is I imagined that in the not far off future, there would be a place, maybe in the cloud, where everyone could go and, it, and have a rich experience. And obviously Khan Academy is already doing parts of that, but the real missing piece is the human to human element. And right now that can happen at, obviously in a physical school in the ways we just described, but with COVID um, that, that kind of has become more difficult. But imagine a world where any student, let's say they're working on systems of equations on Khan Academy, or they're working on photosynthesis on Khan Academy, they're like, oh, I need help. I don't understand this. Or I want to, they can click a button and around the world, there's an amazing teacher who's running a session on that, on Zoom or on, on Skype or whatever else. And then you can immediately go there and get live uh, help, live instruction, uh, even maybe live assessment. Uh, maybe they'll proctor you to say, oh yeah, you know, George Apollo knows, knows his systems of equations. Uh, I think if you do that, not only will it accelerate learning for a lot of people, it could form really powerful connections for a lot of people where you really have uh, this one world schoolhouse. And you know what I say, if, if, we're, if, if we're able to collectively do that, and it's not just me, it's not just our 200 folks at Khan Academy, it's, you know, we're in partnership with folks like yourself, there's 14,000 people around the world who volunteered to, to translate, you know, I, I get excited about thinking about how much potential we could accelerate, you know, for every Albert Einstein or Marie Curie that we know about, Think about how many are, you know, get lost in a favela in Brazil or in a village in India. Uh, I suspect for every Albert Einstein we discover, there's another hundred that get lost. Uh, imagine what they could do for society. And imagine if the whole distribution just becomes that much more knowledgeable, that much more empowered, uh, that many more people are going to be able to participate in, in the knowledge economy, which we know is not a nice to have. We know AI and automation is going to make labor and just basic paperwork a lot less relevant. Uh, as a job. So more people need to participate there. Otherwise, we're going to be in a, in a tough social position. Uh, so, so that's my hope. What's your, what's your 10 year, 10 X hope vision? Uh, oh, uh, my 10 X vision is first uh, survival of the company I'm invested in and have built up over the years. And, you know, that's a priority at the moment simply making sure they get through this crisis at the moment. And in terms of education, I, you know, I, I think uh, uh, anything I can do to improve education in Brazil uh, will be good for Brazil. I think education is the only way to uh, surpass the social gap the social gap we have creates a lot of instability. Uh, and so, you know, the more we can educate people and the better, if 
technology we can bring to make that happen, uh, that will reduce the social gap. And you know, as I look around the world, I see the countries which have invested in education, have done well in education, are basically the ones that do better economically also. And the ones that don't are the ones left behind. So I'm very concerned uh, for Brazil. I uh, have uh, six Brazilian kids, seven Brazilian grandkids. So, you know, I, I want Brazil to be, to catch up. And so anything I can do for education, I'm very interested in doing. And I think uh, what you are doing, and as someone who is in Silicon Valley, aware of all the new technology which is coming out like that, that will play a big role in Brazil. What do you see as the breakthroughs in technology which might happen and why, which might help us in Brazil to improve education? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think on the education side, you know, we're not going to need any super breakthroughs from like a pure technology point of view. It's not like we need quantum computers or, you know, maybe artificial intelligence might help on the margin uh, to, to motivate students or answer some types of questions. Uh, I think it's still just a, it's still kind of a, 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 two, a 2000 type problem of just getting internet access and broadband access to as many students as possible, uh, I think is going to be, it could be a game changer. And then, you know, once you have that, then, you know, the work that we do together, and I really have to thank you, uh, you know, I, we were talking a couple of days ago and, uh, in the very early stages of Khan Academy, you and your team kind of reached out to us. We, I think we were a five or six person organization and y'all had actually come out to California to essentially say, y'all need to come to Brazil. Uh, and, you know, we always had aspirations of, of Khan Academy being an international organization. But if y'all hadn't do, done that, and if not for your significant support of Khan Academy and Khan Academy in Brazil, um, we wouldn't be where we are. We, we wouldn't be talking about uh, the potential of being able to serve so many children in, or, or learners really in Brazil. So I think it's the technology layer and then it's the content layer. And then actually it's the working with the systems layer. Uh, so I don't know if you can call that technology, but I think that's going to be um, a, a, another major piece. And I, I think a lot of the pieces are starting to come into place. And as you mentioned, you know, this is, this is not, I, I think people are realizing through the COVID crisis that the value of the teacher as, as, is as important as ever when you're doing distance learning, when you're doing online learning. And um, so I think as we go through this crisis and as we're leaning heavier in technology, people realize that it's not an either or. And so hopefully, I think we're going to have a lot more teachers um, really advocating it for it themselves. They're going to say, hey, my students are at different levels. I want to be able to cater to their individual needs. I want to be able to have better data. Uh, I want them to have access. I want them to keep learning even when it's a holiday or even when they're on break or um, even after school, which are all sources of inequity. Uh, so, so that's, that's the kind of thing I, I uh, hope to do. Um, I'm curious your, your point of view on, on that. And I, I think then we also are, are going to, if I, if I got the time right, we're going to move on to questions a little bit, but, but yeah, I'd love any, any finishing thoughts for you before we open the questions. Uh, no, it's, it's been a real pleasure to work with the Khan Academy and to be part of this dream to improve the world and, and improve Brazil. So, you know, I'm, uh, I think it's a real, real pleasure to work with you and very satisfying. So count on us to keep going. And I hope we do many things together in the next 10 years. And, and uh, well, 10 years from now, we can look back and say, uh, we've, we've improved the education in Brazil and it has also helped other countries in the world improve their education. So. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, if I had a, if I had a glass I of wine, I'd say questions. cheers. <laughs> I'd be, I'd, I'd, that'd be a good toast if I had something to drink right now, I'd say cheers. Uh, yes, yeah, it looks like we have a question. Um, let's see, and we could, I guess we both could take a shot and see this first question says, how do you think the lack of human connection will impact students in this all digital environment? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, uh, I, I think humans adapt and, you know, there are a lot of people complaining that the kids nowadays, all they do is, uh, is look at their iPhones and don't participate or don't meet. I, I think they, they meet in a different way. 
And I think people like human contact, so they will always look for human contact and they'll find new ways to, to have human contact. So I'm not, uh, I'm not worried. It's going to be a, a question of adjusting. And, uh, you know, and you can, you can have a lot of digital contact. And I think the whole world is finding out now that uh, you can hold a lot of meetings very successfully <laughs> without having to go to the office and things like that. You have to travel less. And, you know, so there are many benefits. And <coughs> maybe we'll have more time left over for other kinds of social contact also if we use, the, you know, online and digital contact. Yeah, I, I kind of seeing similar things. I, I obviously look at my kids. I have three young kids a, aged 11, 8, and 5. And to your point, you know, this something about the, the, the crisis, you know, they're at home. First of all, we're able to spend more time. So they're getting more family contact, which is which has been really nice, uh, a silver lining of, of this crisis. And yeah, you know, it's interesting, uh, the this whole video conferencing, it's obviously not the same as being in a person. So it has some negatives, but it also has some relative positives. Uh, to uh, uh, that, you know, the travel, the lack of frictions. I've definitely connected with family that I hadn't seen in years, and now we're talking to each other every week. Uh, so I think that's something. So I, yeah, I, we, we don't know. It's a question mark. What I tell a lot of people, it's not that all screen time is good or all screen time is bad. And, and for sure, you want to make sure kids do things outside of screen time. You want to make sure they're able to run outside. They have time to draw, paint, uh, play, play games, whatever it is. Uh, but if the screen time is productive, if they're interacting, they're having a Socratic dialogue with the teacher, that can actually be more engaging than if you're just passively in a lecture hall of 300 students <laughs> listening to a lecture, uh, even though you're in the same space together. Uh, so I think there's, um, you know, it's, it's funny, I've, I've talked to some, some, some uh, schools where they're like, oh, how should we use the Zoom? And, they're, and, and I was like, well, just make it as interactive as possible, because otherwise it should just be a video. And, and they're like, oh, that makes sense. And, and then it kind of dawns on them. It was like, well, we should be doing that with our regular classes too. We shouldn't just, you know, have a, a, a lecture for, for an hour and a half at the university. Uh, we should make it interactive. Uh, so in, in a weird way, the technology is pushing us uh, more, more in that direction. I think the next question is for you. Oh, let's see. It says, Khan, do you believe that we could use a platform like Khan can be develop soft skills at scale? Um, Maybe, maybe parts of the soft skills, you know, that, that vision of, um, you know, I, I have thought it, it doesn't have to, it probably won't be Khan Academy per se, but I've, I've tried actually, here's a startup idea for any, you know, free startup idea. Someone take notes. Uh, it let, let's, you know, I remember when I was a, my first job out of college, I was a product manager at Oracle and I took the job because it paid well and it sounded fancy. I had no idea what a product manager was supposed to do. And I actually I suspect a lot of people still kind of, you know, and I, I just showed up and I said, I'm going to make myself useful. I wish there was a place that could show me um, artifacts of what, you know, a good output for a product manager is. I wish there was a place where I could see videos of how to run a meeting, how not to run a meeting. Uh, I wish I had, there were video interviews of product managers who were five years ahead of me, 10 years ahead of me, 15 years ahead of me talking about, what made them successful or what are the mistakes they made and what they look for people, what skills they like to see develop for someone to become a senior product manager, a director. And, you know, I use product management as an example because just, that's just the field that I started my career in. Uh, but I think that's true in, in almost any field. I think so many children, young people, they don't know exactly, you know, you don't get to watch other people's interviews. You don't get to watch other people's interactions and meetings. You don't oftentimes see their output. If you could make that a little bit transparent, I think that would help a lot of folks. So I think you could have a Khan Academy for work. Uh, in fact, a lot of people have asked us to do that and we just haven't had the, so, you know, kind of a workforce training uh, type of thing. Um, so, so I think you could do certain, certain things like that. You know, this vision of one day being able to have a, a, a platform where people could tutor each other. I think that could develop some really powerful soft skills because the ability to tutor and explain has a lot in there. You have to have your subject matter well, uh, no, you have to know that well, but on top of that, you have to be able to communicate, you have to be patient, you have to be a good listener, you have to be able to empathize with folks. And so for someone who's a good teacher in that way, uh, I would love to hire them. And I think other people would love to hire them because they're going to have very strong soft skills and, and even leadership skills. So 
simple answer is kind of, uh, but but obviously being in the real world, uh, whether the real world is on Zoom or <laughs> physically and in other ways, I think that's how you really develop a lot of these these soft skills. And and you know, to the previous question, that's that's one of the things that I hope uh, doesn't get lost. I, I will say though, you know, there are things that do occur in even physical environments that I think sometimes can be even negative for some kids, bullying um, and things like that. And so I think for for certain kids, some of what's going on might even feel safer. Um, because they, you know, they, they feel physically safe. I think all of us in middle school, <laughs> we, we all had our moments where we're like, okay, I hope they don't see me or I can't, wow, I, I'm really glad I'm not that guy. Um, and, and you could imagine that can sometimes get in the way of learning. But, but yeah, it's interesting times. Well, there's a question there about uh, infrastructure in Brazil and connectivity. And uh, the Lehman Foundation has been working very hard at this. And like uh, most things, it's, it's, it's a question of money, but, and also of organization and deciding what is best and getting it done. Now, uh, connectivity, for instance, in Uruguay, which is, uh, which is near Brazil and is not a really, uh, it's an emerging market also, and like that, they've, they've gotten connectivity into all their schools. So uh, it can be done. And in Brazil, the estimates are that it's maybe a cost of $15 billion. $15 billion is a lot of money. But when you think of the benefit that would come from, all, from this and the, the amount of people that could be better educated and would have access to a better education, it's not a big price. In, in comparison to the Brazilian gross national product or like that. So it's a, it's a question of finding the, way, the right way to do it and getting the right people committed to do it, doing it. The telephone companies have a part in this and government has a part. It's a question of coordinating this and making sure we, we do it. And uh, it can be done. And I think this crisis uh, is going to help, help get it done in Brazil. And, you know, other countries have done it. So why can't Brazil do it? We should be able to do it also. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a good point. I always point out, you know, in, 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 in the U.S. and every country is now doing these economic stimulus that, you know, that are large fractions of GDP. You know, in the U.S., obviously, it's a trillion here, trillion there. And it's a similar dollar amount to get Internet access out here. And, it, you know, it's 15 billion sounds like a lot until you compare it to GDP or the government budget. And then it's, it's actually fairly, fairly, fairly small. So we have a question about how do we see the role of teachers in a world where all content is available for free and online, especially in times of pandemic? How do we prepare them for this new environment? Um, I, I, I could take a, a stab at that first. Uh, you, you know, I, I think the role of teachers is only elevated in this, uh, you, you know, there are views of in teacher as kind of the lecturer, as the person who disseminates information. But that not only is that not necessary, but I actually think that's not why people went into the teaching profession. I think people go into the teaching profession because they want to form connections with students. They want to be the adult that unlocks that child, uh, motivates them, fills in the, you know, uh, gives them that, that, ex that slight, you know, that explanation that unlocks them. And so what, what I imagine, and we're seeing this in a lot of classrooms, and as we've talked about, this has been accelerated because of COVID. You, yes, you, you know, for the core content, for the micro lesson, for the practice, that's where online tools can do a lot. But then the teacher can see that data and then can really be the, 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 uh, you know, the, or the conductor of the orchestra, so to speak, uh, and to be able to go and say, okay, this student, you know, the tuba needs to be a little bit louder, <laughs> the conductor. So that student needs a little bit more help, needs some motivation. Let me go sit down next to that person. And for both the student and the teacher, that one-on-one -on -one interaction or that one teacher with three student interaction is a very powerful interaction. And that wasn't possible when it's one teacher with 30 students, 35 students, some cases 40 students, and they're lecturing. Then Many of the kids never get that one-on-one, -on -one, but in a world where they're all able to learn at their own pace, get some of this content, then the teachers can jump in and actually have a five-minute one-on-one uh, or one to three smaller group session with almost every group of children. And I think all of us, you know, when you, we remember our own childhood, the moments of my education that I remember the most is when a teacher took me aside and, and talked to me 
and said, hey, Sal, I noticed this. How about this? And I still remember those moments, you know, 30, 40 years later. And so I think we can maximize more of those moments. And I think those moments are actually more rewarding for teachers uh, because they get to form those human connections, which is, which is why they, they went into the, into the profession for the first place. So I don't think in any way this is going to diminish the role of the teacher. It's going to elevate it. Now, in terms of training, I think this does go, you know, in education schools, they do talk about differentiation. How do you meet the needs of every student? And this plays really well with that. And I think it's also helping teachers, you know, there's think about, okay, how do I unlock kids? How do I, uh, you know, it's, there's going to be elements of a psychologist here. There's going to be elements of a coach here. There's going to be elements of a conductor here. Uh, so I think that's the type of training that I think could be super, super valuable. I don't know, George Paul, if you have ideas there? Oh, well, my experience is not very vast, but, you know, in Brazil, where I've seen Khan Academy being introduced, Initially, there was a reaction of some suspicion by teachers and like that. And what we found out is that once they learn how to use it and they, they know how to use it and they can interrelate more with the students and have a bigger dialogue with the students and like that, they, they actually like it. And then they themselves use Khan Academy a lot to learn more and like that. So uh, I think it's... It's very satisfying for the teachers also. Eventually, once they learn how to use the tool, they can do their job much better. So I think with time goes by, uh, you know, they will, they will be much more favorable towards using distance learning uh, as a tool that can help them. Yeah. And it saves them a lot of time too. Like, you know, they don't have to do as much of the grading and all, all of that stuff gets automated. So yeah, I completely agree. So it looks There's like one more there. Yes. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Many people feel that distance learning was much more challenging for kindergarten in early years. What are the thoughts about this fact? And what is the future vision of the Khan Academy Kids app? Well, I, I can, you know, if I use my own home as a uh, as a lab for that uh, thesis, I think it is true. Uh, you know, the my my kids go to a school that I, I started, I helped start, which is called Khan Lab School, which is all about how do you give students agency how do you put them in control of their own learning path personalized learning things like that and so when this when the school had to go virtual my 11 year old and 8 year old actually have been able to do it quite seamlessly and once again their teachers are doing amazing things with them they're getting on daily you know one on one sessions they're able to do have socratic dialogue with their teachers our 5 year old to the question point was a little bit more difficult and so it's caused a little bit of tension between me and me and my wife on the moments uh, but you know what we're what, there's a couple of things uh, the questioner asks about Khan Academy Kids uh, so Khan Academy Kids is right now available in the US and English um, that is, you know, it goes through uh, pre-K as early, you know, kids as early as age two, all the way through kindergarten and first grade standards. I would say that I'm very impressed by what that team did. I like to, I like to really uh, praise them because I don't, I really don't deserve any credit for that. We, we it's an incredible uh, team that built out Khan Academy Kids, uh, and it's not, it's math, it's reading, it's writing, it's social emotional learning, and I've seen also with my own five year old that is engaging him quite well, and he's learning quite well and, and quite accelerated. There's actually just a, an efficacy study just came out from University of Massachusetts where they took a group, it was a, a randomized control trial where they took a group of a low income students, uh, a kids, four year olds, uh, whose um, they were performing in the 30th percentile. And when they were able to do 20 minutes a day for 40 days, so not a long period of time, it completely closed the gap between those students and children of wealthier families. So those kids went from the 30th percentile to the 50th percentile in about a month and a half of just doing Khan Academy kids for 20 minutes a day relative to the controls. Uh, so that is very, very promising because we all know a lot of these gaps, a lot of the inequity, it starts early. Uh, and uh, so we're excited that, you know, something that can be that can operate on a smartphone, on a low cost smartphone can help close the gap in that way. Uh, the vision is. Uh, you know, over time, uh, it's we, we want to go into second grade, maybe third grade. We want to make it available in the languages of the world. You know, as 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 the capacity becomes available, you know, obviously Brazilian, Portuguese and Spanish, I think, would be our top two priorities outside of English. So 
uh, that's the dream. But yeah, it, to the question's point, it is harder with, with a five or six year, year old or four year old. They are less self-regulated. They, they you know, they're, 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 they're five years old. And so, uh, but what I have found, you know, some homeschooling parents told me, look, just stick with it. Even your five-year-old will get used to it. And I, I, we are starting to see that when you expect more of your children, it's hard sometimes <laughs> and there are tantrums, but they do step up. So even our five-year-old is getting used to a little bit more of this independent learning. Uh, why don't I take that to start and then you can finish off. Uh, you talked about philanthropy. How can a regular person start doing something to improve education? Well, I don't think you have to be wealthy or, uh, you know, you, you, you can do your philanthropy. Uh, basically, uh, if you are somebody who has studied or has a, a special knowledge in an area, you can mentor other people. That's a a good way to, to do philanthropy in a small way. And if that is successful, you can transform it into a bigger organization which mentors more people and attracts the ones you have mentored to mentored others, like we have done at Fundação Estudar. Uh, you can latch on to a, a philanthropic effort and, and help that effort or raise funds for it or like that. So I don't think you have to be uh, rich or powerful or, or, or old or anything to start doing philanthropic things. You can start in a small way and that's what makes the world a better place. It's people who want to help others to do better and this and teaching other people to help others again and that's what makes the world better. So you can start philanthropy at any age with any amount of money. And I think you will enjoy it and feel, feel realized because you're doing it. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, to your point, George Apollo, uh, philanthropy can be with uh, resources. It can be with time. It can be with your energies. And, you know, my the type, you know, George Apollo is a much more accomplished entrepreneur <laughs> than I could ever think about being. But, you know, my flavor of entrepreneurship that I like is if you're, if there's a problem space that's interesting to you, say education, get, you know, roll up your sleeves and start doing stuff in there, volunteering, start te teaching yourself. That's how I got started. I was tutoring my cousin, uh, but I knew I was, I was intrigued with the broader problem. So by tutoring my cousin, I was able to learn and I kept thinking, can I make the scale? And I'm tutoring more cousins. I'm, I'm making it public. I'm, I'm making it available for more people. Okay, what's a model where this could work? And it could be for profit, it could be nonprofit, whatever you think is right. But I'm a big fan of just getting started. And just while you're having that impact and feeling good about it, thinking about, okay, how do I serve more people? How do I scale? How do I bring more people in, in, into the fold? So, you know, good luck. And, and thanks. Thanks for that question. So it looks like hey, we're. Sean, I think we're over. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. As thank said you. Before, it's an enormous pleasure to work with you, to be part of your dream, to help a little bit with a dream. And, you know, I look forward to the coming years to doing more. Likewise. We're supposed to pass it to Rodrigo or something. Yes. <laughs> Are you there, Rodrigo? <laughs> All right, yes. Thank you so much, George and Sal, for this great conversation. I'm sure our audience is living today inspired and looking forward to the future of education. Today was a glimpse of the new normal. Despite a few connectivity issues, we were able to connect George from Switzerland, Sal from California, and the team from Brazil and broadcast to the entire world. So before we leave, I would like to remind everyone that hasn't followed us on our social medias to do so, so you can learn about next week's panel. Also, this panel and all past panels are available on our YouTube channel. I will see you next week. Thank you and goodbye.